Hey, that's the Spiel for 64K and welcome to another episode of Top Tens. Welcome to 64K, hosted by Bass Tishby. And welcome back. So in today's episode, I'm going to be having a look at my top 10 favorite flight simulators on the Commodore 64. This is one I've been wanting to make for a very long time, but just due to the time it takes to actually make something like this, you know, playing all these games and remembering how to play them, that was a big issue. <laughs> anyway, I've been going through all my favorites from the past. I actually discovered a couple of ones that I never actually got to play back in the day. I always wanted to. So it's a pretty comprehensive list. I hope you enjoy it. And as per usual, there'll be an honorable mentions list just before the number one reveal. But let's not waste any more time and get on with the show. Night Raider was released by Gremlin Graphics in 1988. The game also goes under the name Dive Bomber for its US release, published by a US Gold Epix collaboration. This game is essentially a newer, at least back then, version of 1985's The Dam Busters, with the game giving you one mission as well, to sink the Bismarck. If you don't know what that is, it was a real-life German World War II battleship, which joined the German battle fleet in 1940, and was the biggest warship ever to set sail. The ship was eventually sunk in May of 1941 with multiple allied ships of the Royal Navy in a full-on attack in the North Atlantic. Your mission is to fly a Grumman Avenger plane, which was said to be the plane that dropped the final torpedo that ultimately sunk the ship. The entire mission is here, from the takeoff, navigation, flying and dropping that final torpedo. You have to jump around the cabin like in the dam busters, keep updating your map, staying on target and taking out other aircraft and of course making that all-important run for that final shot on the ship itself. The controls are kept fairly simple in this game and remind me a lot of Accolades Ace of Aces in its style with good graphics and atmosphere. It's easy to get into also and also very easy to die but considering there's only one real mission in this game it can't possibly be that much of a walk in the park. It's a great variation on the single mission style flotsam. Number nine. F-15 Strike Eagle was released by Micropost in 1985 and was designed by Simulation King himself, Sid Meier. The game is based on a real-life F-15 Eagle that took its first flight in 1972. It went into military service in every single mission presented in this game, all seven including locations such as Libya, Hanoi and the Persian Gulf and many many more. Strike Eagle is still one of Micropost's very early flight simulators though, so it's not quite as refined or as complicated as future entries. But what it does do, it does quite well. The game doesn't waste any time either and it throws you straight into missions immediately. No takeoffs, just straight to the action. Choose from a mission and the difficulty level with also an interesting arcade mode which takes most of the flight simulation aspects out and turns the game into a first person afterburner. You have all the usual assortment of machine guns, guided missiles and ground based bombs to switch to as you take out enemy SAM installations and aircraft. The graphics are all done in vector style as was the standard in a lot of flight simulators in the 80s. The game as per Micropro standards comes packed with an absolutely dense manual with tons of background information and all the keyboard functions needed. You'll need to check those out if you want any hope of surviving. Make sure you learn those countermeasures as well or else your flying days will be very short lived. It's a bit simplistic overall for a Micropro game but it's fairly easy and quick to get into so it's a lot more user friendly in a sense and definitely worth playing if you like your sims a bit more dull back with a lot more action. Number eight. F-14 Tomcat was published by Activision in 1988 but developed by Dynamics, the future kings of the flotsam genre. 
done long before their massive PC successes of the Aces and Red Baron Sim series. Designed by Jeff Tunnell, who created the original survival horror game Project Firestart on the Commodore 64 one year later, and two other of my favourite adventure games being Heart of China and Rise of the Dragon. The game leans more into the arcade action territory, with the flight sim aspects being pretty simple and easy to understand. What I like here is the presentation. It's exceptional. Mission briefings, news reports, after missions and tons of flash make the whole experience really engaging. You can do quick missions which there are 80 of in total or go for the full campaign mode which is the best part of the game and is where all the cinematic flash, basic training and working your way up the military ranks all comes into effect. The game's focus here is definitely on aerial combat as you go up against MiGs and full on dogfights. With an assortment of missiles and some Vulcan cannon fire, I like the fact that you can radio other planes or even your base to find out whether they are allies or hostiles. Or if the mission is taking place in a full wartime situation then every Everything and everyone is your enemy and you can just go totally berserk and shoot everything. There is so much depth in the career mode though, from mission outcomes affecting your overall career to being captured by the enemy and lots more. The flight sim aspects are a bit simplistic as Zap64 stated in their May 1989 issue, but I feel the great atmosphere and production values plus seeing dynamics in action before their massive flight sim success later is worth the price of admission. The Dam Busters was published in 1985 by Accolade on the C64, with Sydney Development making the game. A Canadian software company who delivered two of Accolade's early hits with this and the really fun boxing game Fight Night. And my favourite game of theirs has to be Desert Fox, the tank arcade strategy game published by US Gold. This game itself is a World War II flight simulator putting you in the role of a pilot as you fly a Lancaster RAF bomber behind German lines to bomb a dam, thus flooding the entire German German factory and infrastructure and crippling their ability to produce weapons. This game is based on the real life mission flown by the British RAF carried out in May of 1943 where they managed to take out multiple dams with the use of the newly developed bouncing bombs which skimmed the water bouncing to their target and taking it out. The game lets you reenact this epic mission. It's equal parts flight simulator, strategy and arcade action as you plot your course, attempting to avoid German spotlights and air balloons, fight off attacks from the air me 110 night fighters and eventually if you manage all that to keep the plane intact you'll have to perform the critical bombing run on the dam with only one shot for victory. If you thought Luke's Death Star trench run was intense, well this makes that look like a walk in the park. I'd highly suggest doing a practice run first though to get the full grips of the vital bombing mechanic, but oh man is it satisfying getting that perfect shot when you play the real mission. This game is chaotic and stressful, the action segments are fun and intense and keeping track of your map, your compass direction and miscellaneous gauges all add up to an extremely satisfying experience. And considering that this game came out in 1985 makes it even more impressive. And if you want to know more about the history of this epic mission, check out the classic 1955 UK movie The Dam Busters for an excellent homage to this important mission. Solo Flight was released by Microprose in 1985 on the C64 and is an enhanced version of the Atari 8-bit 1983 release, delivering superior graphics, more options, training missions and lots of in-flight speech samples to make it the best version of this game available. 1985 was the year Microprose upped their game dramatically. They went from the primitive mediocrity of Hellcat Ace and Spitfire Ace to delivering three classic simulations in 85 which were F-15 Strike Eagle, Silent Service and their second edition of Solar Flight. This game is also unique as it's a non-combat game where you have to deliver mail in various US states. You're probably thinking, this sounds lame and boring, but it's anything but that. The graphics, control and speech up the game making you really feel like you're flying the skies over Kansas, Colorado and Washington. It's not only flying but also strategy is needed. The more mail and fuel you load up on means the heavier your plane is going to be, so obviously less maneuverable. It's a balance between both as you plot your course on the map, weather conditions as well as day and night missions all come into play. Being able to see your plane and the instrument panel is a bit odd at first, but is a very cool mechanic that makes takeoffs and landings a lot easier to get to grips with. This was one of the first few flight simulators I ever played at my friend's house on his C64 after I got mine. We spend hours flying, meticulously landing, loading up on mail and fuel before plotting out 
our next course and taking off. It was the C64's version of Microsoft Flight Simulator and absolutely no regrets. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. F-16 Combat Pilot was released by Digital Integration in 1990 and I'll be honest when I say I was never a fan of their earlier simulations such as Fighter Pilot and Tomahawk but this was on a whole new level for them. This game is very detailed so finding a manual PDF or the original is imperative to being able to play this game properly. It gives you five varied missions to fly from Tank Buster taking out a bunch of tanks Watchtower which is a stealth recon mission, Scramble which you dogfight a bunch of MiGs, etc etc. They are all extremely varied and play drastically different from one another which gives this game a unique feel from most other flight simulators. The in-game graphics are extremely good and varied and move at a cracking pace with plenty to keep you busy during missions. Equipping up your plane and heading out to the action is just a great experience overall. As a bonus is the complete strategy element where if you rank up enough to a higher level you get to be the commander of an entire squadron which you can send off to complete missions for you and still be able to fly whatever you want yourself. It's an impressive simulation and delivers the goods on all levels. Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer was released in 1987 by Electronic Arts. If you don't know who Chuck is, he was an Air Force pilot that got his start during World War II. But after the war he became a test pilot for many experimental planes. But his claim to fame came in 1947 when he became the first pilot in history to exceed the speed of sound when he flew the experimental Bell X-1 at Mark 1 in October of that year. The game itself almost feels like a real life flight instruction manual or as real as an 8-bit computer could do in 1987. But seriously it's still a very impressive game to play right now. The sheer amount of options and variety in this game is quite astounding and implemented oh so well. You can go under Jaeger's wing so to speak as you go through all sorts of real life flight training missions. You can do competition style Blue Angel stun courses, become a test pilot yourself for experimental jets and even fly the Bell X-1 that Chuck broke the sound barrier in and race other planes in time trial type scenarios. The amount and variety of planes is also crazy with 14 in total. Everything from a Sopworth Camel biplane to World War II Mustangs, Lockheed SR-71 and even an F-18 Hornet. The 3D outside views are really impressive as well with 10 different viewpoints to switch to in real time and even the option to save your mission and watch it afterwards in full 3D is crazy crazy ambitious for 1987. I've said this before on this channel but 80s electronic arts were amazing. They took risks, pushed the envelope and always delivered new experiences. Chuck Yeager is like no other flight sim on the C64. It feels completely unique and the game ranked up rave reviews back in the day with Zap64 awarding it a sizzler in their December 87 issue with a 95% overall saying fast, exhilarating and extremely polished. This game is well worth your your time investment. Ace of Aces was released in 1986 by Accolade and is another amazing action simulator. This one flat from one of the best companies on the C64 for this style of game. You take control of a World War II bomber plane with missions involving bombing German U-boats, trains and taking out V rockets. You start by loading up your plane, making the choice as to how much ammo, bombs and fuel you're going to need for a mission. Making this balance is critical to success. Like the train, you have a map to plan your strategy and you got full control over the bombing and flight controls. Taking out targets and the occasional dogfight with the incoming Luftwaffe fighters, all the while making sure you don't waste too much fuel or else you'll never make it back home alive. Excellent high-res graphics and good sound effects round out the atmosphere. 
and its combination of arcade action and light flotsam aspects make it a very easy game to get into for this genre and one I played over and over again as a kid and completed every mission. Zap actually managed to get a review right for once and gave it an 88% overall in issue number 20 December 1986 and I feel this is another fine example of the C64 version being head and shoulders above all the mediocre ports of this game. Gunship was released in 1986 by Microprose. This wasn't their first simulator, but this was the one that took them to the next level. It's a big, deep and beautifully presented flight sim based on an AH-64 Apache helicopter that had just been introduced to the US military at that time. Andy Hollis was the designer, a veteran at Microprose who worked on in some capacity just like Sid Meier on all their biggest hits including Stealth Fighter and Pirates. The game was a deep simulator offering much more detail and cinematic style than any other game on the market back then. I remember playing this for hours on end with that big chunky keyboard overlay and the manual that reading it almost made you feel like you could actually fly a real helicopter if somebody bothered to give you a test. The game's goal is to rank up by completing missions and earning medals. There were four major theaters of combat on offer including Vietnam, Nicaragua, the Middle East and the Third World War in Europe. The last was a scenario that would also be the focus of Microposis Red Storm Rising a few years later. Despite its initial complexity, just like Project Stealth Fighter, you can choose to make it as complicated or as simple as you want, which makes it a fairly easy for this genre of game to get into, as long as you have the manual and a little bit of patience of course. Slick graphics and presentation, complicated but rewarding gameplay make it a must play. It's the best helicopter simulation on the old bread box for sure. Okay, so let's just stop this list just for a few seconds here and check out some of my honorable mentions. First up is Super Huey 1 and 2 by Cosme and designer Paul Norman, both helicopter simulators and not ultra realistic in any respects, but offer a bunch of interesting missions, mostly rescue style, with the second game really throwing the realism way out the window with some wacky mission types. Spitfire 40 is a dogfight sim from Mirasoft. It attempts and does one-up Microprose's Spitfire Ace, but that's really not saying much. It's simply too basic overall, but if you like straight action, it's okay. Snowstrike from Epix was their last C64 game and is actually a pretty solid flight sim overall with good missions and presentation. This game got completely lost with the fall of the company in the early 90s. Strike Force Harrier is a flawed but fun in short bursts Harrier sim that suffers from hard to get to grips with gameplay but if you persevere there's something worth checking out. F-18 Hornet is a good but just never managed to capture my imagination as much as F-16 Combat Pilot but with some dedication though I think it's well worth trying. Acrojet by Microprose is a stunt version of Solo Flight flying competition style events. It's good but I just didn't like it as much as Solo Flight. Ace is a fast paced sim that's more arcade action than sim in the end and gets repetitive really quickly simply because it throws everything at you in its first five minutes and then just hits the repeat button. And lastly is Fighter Bomber, a game that I played a lot back in the day, but upon revisiting it for this video it just doesn't hold up anymore, it's way too slow and bland, even though the production values are great. Just play the DOS version instead, it's vastly superior. And also don't forget to check me out on all social media for a lot more retro gaming goodness. And check out the companion piece video to this, my top 10 favorite navy simulations on the Commodore 64, checking out warship and submarine simulators. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Okay, so now it's time for my number one game.
Project Stealth Fighter was released by Microprose in 1987. It was and is their best flight simulator on the Commodore 64, only rivaled by their own gunship which came out one year earlier. The game was designed by Jim Sinoski and Arnold Hendrick and it pushed the then combat flight sim genre to the absolute limits of realism as far as controlling your craft and the setting and realistic nature of the campaigns and missions. Although the plane was not exactly a real plane, it was at the time based loosely on a stealth bomber which was first used in combat in 1989 during Operation Just Cause in Panama. You take the role of a pilot that could take on missions from all over the world with Libya, the Persian Gulf and Central Europe being some of the locations. The game's attention to detail in every aspect from the excellent graphics and presentation to the brilliant sound effects plus a manual that was every bit as detailed as Silent Service or Red Storm Rising's mammoth tomes. Like most Micropost games you also got one of those awesome keyboard overlays to help keep track of all the keyboard functions in the game. Out of all the simulation games on the C64 I've played, this is the best. I remember distinctly flying over 28 successful missions and upgrading my rank and I still have my old save game disc from back in the day. Zap64 magazine gave this one a perfect score of 96% and I agree with them 100%. The following year in 1988 also saw the release of the updated versions on DOS and Amiga, retitled F-19 Stealth Fighter, which are both fantastic versions but don't in any way take away from this brilliant creation that any Commodore 64 flight simulation enthusiast should play. And thanks again for joining me for another episode of Top 10s. I'm Bassish B. If you can please like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.